same room. Enjoy. Hello, my name is D'Angela Duff, and I'm an Associate Vice Provost and Industry Professor at NYU. And today I would like to present to you Controversy, the Blueprint of Prince's Musical Transformation and Disruption. How is controversy seen by most? One of this year's best rock albums from any source is Princess Controversy. This is what Jeffrey Himes said in the Baltimore Sun in real time in November of 1981 in the article, Whites Are Missing Good Rock by Blacks. However, most of the reviews of controversy over the years have not been so favorable. Another review in Cream from February of 1983 by Richard Regal is one of the most brutal. Controversy marked time last year. And then David Brown in Entertainment Weekly said that Controversy was basically Dirtier Mind. And Dirty Mind was the album that preceded Controversy in the year prior, 1980. In the 2013 book by Matt Thorne, Prince, he states, that of the first 10 albums, Controversy, while a fascinating record in its own right, initially seems the most disposable. Every track on the record has its charms, but none feel truly essential. In an article the day after Prince transitioned, Simon Price wrote in The Guardian that Controversy was a stopgap, delivering little that Dirty Mind hadn't already given us. Daphne Brooks wrote one of the most comprehensive and thoughtful articles about controversy, also in April of 2016 for Pitchfork. And she wrote, controversy is often thought of as the bridge between Prince's path-breaking dirty mind and the epic new world making 1999. Some see dirty mind as the foundation. In the same article I cited earlier, Simon Price said of Dirty Mind, the album with which Prince really found his direction. At the Prince Symposium I created and curated at the end of March of this year, one plus one plus one is three, celebrating 40 years of controversy, 30 years of diamonds and pearls, and 20 years of the Rainbow Children, Arthur Turnbull of the Music Snobs and other podcasts reiterated that Dirty Mind was the foundation, the bedrock of Prince's career. Um, I know that I personally have talked uh, at length and passionately about the Dirty Mind album being the, the foundation, uh, the foundational album of what we know as Prince throughout the rest of his career. And controversy as an album sometimes gets lost in the overwhelming shadow of 1999. But I really look at controversy, you know, as as that mortar that holds the bricks of 1990 get, uh, 1999 together to the foundation of Dirty Mind. And sometimes we don't marvel at the beauty of, you know, well-made mortar that holds it all together. For me, Dirty Mind is a stepping stone, simply a prototype for controversy. So we see controversy to the right, Dirty Mind to the left. You see the appearance of the Rude Boy pen on the Dirty Mind album cover, but it takes more prominence on the controversy cover. You begin to see the coat silhouettes, which will be very critical to 1999, as well as Purple Rain. And this incarnation of the coat, you see the pyramid studs on both sets of shoulders, Dirty Mind as well as controversy. With Dirty Mind, Prince has lyrics that begin to address race. However, he continues this exploration on the album Controversy, and more specifically with the title track, Controversy, with Am I Black or White? The primary focus of Dirty Mind is S-E-X, explicit sexual references. You get it with the title track, as well as Do It All Night, head and the lyrical content of sister. You also get it in Prince's fashion style. He did not hang out the bikinis and leg warmers with Dirty Mind. He continued with this look on the controversy tour. 
However, sexual lyrics weren't new with Prince. This went back as far as his very first album, 1978's For You, on the song Soft and Wet. So Dirt in Your Mind is not the first. Because Dirt in Your Mind puts sex brazenly front and center, Jeffrey Himes rightfully asks, where can he go from here? He seems to have pushed the sex issue as far in this limit testing direction as he can. He's building himself a door out of the box. He has built for himself with controversy. And this is from an article in Musician, 1982, Prince Warner Theater, Washington, DC. Jeffrey Himes would go on to say that controversy may very well move on to an even more powerful phase of Prince's career. And in fact, controversy delivered on that promise. So the thesis of this talk is controversy is the blueprint for Prince's entire career. A very bold statement, but hopefully I can back it up. In the book, Prince Before the Rain by Alan Bolio, Alan describes how Prince wanted to prominently display headlines on the cover. Al, what I want you to do is shoot me on a newspaper. However, Prince gave Alan Bolio, the photographer, so many headlines and Al came back to Prince and said, I need just four headlines. Prince went with the request of editing it down to four. And by reading these four headlines, you really get a sense of what Prince was, would focus on for this album, but also for the rest of his career. You see love, which was very important to Prince thematically, God, death, and politics, which he would weave in and out of the, weave in and out of over the course of his career. And I mean politics with a capital P. There were obviously socio-political themes that he was always dealing with. Again, these are things you continue to see throughout his career. One of my favorite examples of this is a 1986 poster sold on the parade tour, which encapsulates three out of the four. Again, love, God, and death, all together as one. Some of the most powerful lyrics on controversy to me have always been, some people want to die so they can be free. During the next year, you get the song free on Prince's next album, 1999. Be glad that you are free, free to change your mind, free to go most anywhere, anytime. The first complete unreleased album from the vault, Welcome to America, which will be released in July of this year. These themes are still prominent here as well with Born to Die and One Day We Will All Be Free. What controversy is the blueprint or foundation for Prince's entire career as opposed to Dirty Mind is this was the album where Prince mixed the sacred with the profane and talked about politics with a capital P for the first time in a robust way. You have religious iconography in the advertisements for the album as well as the poster that was included in the album. The religious iconography will continue in the video for controversy. You would get the recitation of the Lord's Prayer in the title track. Also in the title track, you would get Prince's own litany. People call me rude. I wish we all were nude. I wish there was no black or white. I wish there were no rules. You get gospel overtones with the acapella track, The Second Coming, which opened the controversy tour. Before the second coming. However, you can throw a clear line from the second coming to the very first track for you off of Prince's first album released in 1978 of the same name. So all roads either lead to or back to controversy. 
Chris's songwriting gets really interesting on controversy due to expressing his social political awareness. He begins to write about headlines from 1980 and 1981 on this record. In real time, Ronnie Talk to Russia either got dismissed or ridiculed because of the light fare of the music itself. It's fast and upbeat. People didn't take it seriously. However, again, Prince was reading the headlines. You could tell that he knew what was going on in the world. The song that you can point to, however, to know that Prince was very conscious of what was going on was Annie Christian. He talks about the land of child murders, about Lynn being shot, about Reagan being shot, about ASP scam. Then with controversy, you get the appearance of Prince's signature scream. With controversy, you get the template of what Prince can do almost better than anyone, the slow jam with Do Me Baby. And he would continue that awesome thread with International Lover, Scandalous, Insatiable, shh, and so on. And I personally believe due to, the, due to the fiasco of opening up for the Rolling Stones days before the release of the Controversy album, he really honed his stage performance and would become the best to ever do it. Most notably playing guitar on speaker stacks as you see, as you saw in this 1982 Houston show. This is the footage from an unreleased film also entitled The Second Coming, directed by Chuck Statler, which he was going to intercut with footage from the controversy tour. He was already thinking about the visual language of narrative cinema, of the visual presentation of his music. He would predate Beyonce's concept of the visual album by decades. This is so very important to wrap your head around. Purple Rain wasn't conceived in a vacuum and more narrative films would follow, my favorite being Under the Cherry Moon from 1986. The structure of The Second Coming would ultimately become the template for the Sound of Times concert film in 1987. Also with the controversy era, you get Prince beginning to build his own world and in so doing, take us to another world, an alternate purple universe, a purple kingdom, whatever you wanna call it, beginning with the time. Morris Day would become his alter ego and Jamie Starr is a thief. And it would continue with Vanity Six, Sheila E, Apollonia Six, The Family, Joe Jones, Madhouse, and so many more. Before and after controversy, Prince established and encouraged movements. You had the rebels, the Revolution, Bold Generation, Love Sexy, Love Sexy, New Power Generation, New Power Soul, and The Rainbow, the Rainbow Children. Children. But for me, the movement that really resonated the most was the New Breed. I wanted to be a part of the New Breed. Again, before and after controversy, Prince did a lot of placemaking. Uptown is where I want to be. Paisley Park is in your heart. Everybody wants to find Graffiti Bridge. And in 1986, he would manifest this as a physical reality with a 55,000 square feet facility, Paisley Park in Minneapolis, where he was born and raised. But the song that really resonated with me in terms of Prince's placemaking is sexuality again. Whenever I want to escape, I can go to the purple world whenever I want. Because in sexuality, he let us know that he could take us to another world. And he can take us tonight or anytime we want. And with this record, the most important thing that Prince created was his own mythology, the mythology of Prince. Prince made the public question who he was. There was a lot of purposeful misdirection in Prince's early career. This was the beginning of the mysterious Prince. I just can't believe all the things people say. Am I black or white? Am I straight or gay? Do I believe in God? Do I believe in me? 
we don't have time to go deeper down this mythology rabbit hole. However, if you want to follow me on this journey, join me in June at the Prince 7888 virtual conference for a continuation of this talk, Prince Conjuring the Mystique. So in conclusion, Prince will be forever known for Purple Rain. The album and film of the same title was absolutely the apex of his commercial success. The estate capitalized on this immediately following Prince's death, even though it was already in the works before he transitioned. This was the first deluxe release post Prince. That's what I call it. 1999 is also extremely important to his discography, his legacy. This is where his audience began to shift from predominantly black audiences to predominantly white audiences. Again, the estate recognized its importance by choosing 1999 for his second deluxe treatment. But many critics consider Sign of the Times to be Prince's masterpiece. Brad Nelson in a 2020 Pitchfork article said so much. He said that Sign of the Times is probably the most complete exhibition of Prince's talent. However, in my humble opinion, you could say the same thing about controversy. Sign of the Times is a very important album in Prince's catalog and the estate realized this and released a super duper deluxe edition of Sign of the Times last year. I'm hoping that controversy gets reevaluated by scholars and critics alike so that it can be placed where it rightfully belongs at the top. I want to leave you with some words from Scott Woods, also from the one plus one plus one is three symposium. He summarizes what I tried to communicate with this talk so well. So the reason why we're all gathered here today is, in my opinion, because of this record. Um, the prince that we would come to know, the prince that the world recognizes beyond the fan base, right, begins with this record. All of the topics that he would move moving forward with almost, almost, not all, but almost every record after, um, you know, the topics that he would tackle you know, are present in this record first, you know, collectively. Like the impact of this record is undeniable, undeniable. And the, and just to answer a previous question very quickly, there are no skippable tracks on controversy. There are simply tracks you are not ready for. So thank you for listening. I hope you'll go put on controversy and listen to it with the reverence it deserves. Hello, I'm Camila Cummings, and thank you for attending my presentation, Purple Lace and Race, Prince and the Art of Protest. In many ways, Prince's entire career was a disruption. Although his contributions to racial discourse in the public sphere are often overlooked, from his music and films to his ever-evolving performance of identity and bold career moves, Prince's subversion was rooted in his Blackness. He was a change agent who protested the status quo, challenging the music industry and society to re-envision possibilities for Black musicians as artists and activists. As this presentation will demonstrate, Prince embedded protests throughout his art. As my co-panelist, the brilliant Celie McInnes uh, Jr. tells us, the creation of art for African Americans has always been a practical and utilitarian engagement to reclaim their humanity. Therefore, African Americans must create art because it is an innate part of their liberation struggle. As he said, it's not just arts for arts activity or art for art's sake. So when we think about Prince, he's been described as a genius, transgressive, uh, revolutionary because he thwarted convention and forged a legacy that interrupted patterns of thinking about music, creativity, gender, race, politics, sexuality, spirituality, and also business. He once stated that when he first entered the industry, he was most concerned with freedom. That freedom found many incarnations throughout his career. However, ultimately, he was an artist activist whose activism was a continuation of Black people's ongoing struggle for freedom. 
Prince used his art to disrupt systems of believing and being to expand possibilities for not only himself, but for other Black artists. Although Prince is not often included in conversations about revolutionary Black artists as activists, a deeper look at his career reveals that protests undergirds his art. Born in 1958, Prince came into being artistically and ideologically during a time when the Black power and Black arts movements flourished in the Black community, particularly in Black music as artists like James Brown and Marvin Gaye, Stevie Wonder, Curtis Mayfield, Sly and the Family Stone, Nina Simone, Aretha Franklin, you name it, they all became increasingly politicized and engaged in protests through their art. This undoubtedly influenced Prince's understanding of the power of music to uplift and inspire, especially because he's named all of these people as influences. When we look at these quotes about Prince, Mary Ellison says, Prince is a man that catalyzes rethinking as easily as he gets people out on the dance floor. If it's true that Black music is Black history, then Prince is an irrefutable part of that history. It is nearly impossible to analyze his music without making reference to his statements and public actions. So let's look at some of those statements and actions. My first exemplar of Prince as a protest artist is uh, the film Purple Rain. Having emerged as an artist in a highly segregated music industry where Black music and artists were culturally influential but undervalued and denied the opportunities of their white counterparts, Prince refused to be limited by myopic notions of what it meant to be a Black artist. After breaking into the crossover market, when MTV finally began airing Black videos two years after its inception, Prince knew a film would be the final big ticket item to ensure the level of crossover success that would provide him the financial independence to more overtly strengthen the nexus between his art and activism. Sociologist Dennis Forsyth put forth that a degree of independence is needed to take action on behalf of Blacks. So when we think about Prince getting Purple Rain made, this wasn't just an individual victory, it benefited others as well. This was an act of disruption, particularly because it was unheard of at the time for a Black artist, especially a Black male artist, to be the star of a film, to have a film as a vehicle to catapult him into a greater level of success. We hadn't seen anything like this since Diana Ross playing Billie Holiday, who was already an icon, and Diana Ross was an icon in her own right, having been with the Supremes uh, in 1972. But here we are almost 12 years later, and Prince is still virtually unknown to white audiences, though he's very popular with Black um, audiences. He was already a star for us. So he faced a lot of obstacles in getting this film made. In Alan Light's book, The Making of Purple Rain, uh, there's a quote from Warner Brothers executives and market analysts where they said, our analysis tells us that this movie will play for one weekend and the audience will consist of 14-year-old Black girls in the inner city wrong. Prince just kept pushing and everybody turned us down. Nobody wanted to give me the money. We were going to, we were going to make a movie with unknown Black people in front of the camera. And finally, Morris Day said even super smart moguls like David Geffen couldn't see this movie making money. But telling Prince he couldn't do something was a guarantee that he'd do it. And he did. He even underwrote part of the $7 million budget with his own money as part of the art for the film. He wanted his name above the title and he wanted it to say in his first motion picture to convey how historic this was. And so the massive success of the film starring a virtually unknown cast of Black people was, as I said, quite disruptive. Uh, here was Prince providing a window into the Black music scene in Minneapolis in the 1980s, uh, presenting yet another chapter, an unseen chapter to that point of the Black experience in America. And like music, film is another powerful artistic medium for disrupting narratives and reclaiming identity. His manager at the time, uh, Albert Magnoli, commented that the success of Purple Rain was 
was shocking because the film was being appreciated in a way that defies conventional wisdom because it's a mostly black cast. However, that success enabled movies like The Last Dragon and um, Crush Groove to be made. And for even today, when we see people like Beyonce and Donald Glover uh, starring in films, no one has quite reached the height of Prince with what he did with Purple Rain, but it opened doors for a lot more um, Black artists. And although Prince would make more films, music was his primary artistic medium. As these quotes reflect, his lyrics were as important to him as his beats and harmonies. Much of his catalog can be viewed as protest music. Vandergriff points out, music does not create change, people do, but music inspires people to action. Music can foster a sense of solidarity. Further, she adds, today, effective protest music calls attention to a problem and invites or inspires listeners to act. Prince did this with much of his catalog, which as I said, could be categorized as protest music. Here back early in his career in 82, he said that rather than focus on making money, he wanted to give people what they needed and not just what they wanted. Later in 1999, he said, it's very obvious when you hear words and lyrics, whether they enlighten or discourage. In that 1999 interview with MTV, he also lamented that music that was dominating the airwaves at the time possessed a great deal of what he called, quote, negativity and entropy. He cautioned there is a disintegration that we really need to address as a community as to what it is doing to the culture. So one of Prince's acts of protest with his music uh, happened in the 90s when he denied uh, several rappers requests to sample his music and explaining his um, decisions, he told Chris Rock, I just don't want my music used that way. I don't want to contribute to the problem. The problem he saw was the misogyny and violence that prevailed in a significant segment of mainstream 1990s Black music. Prince is known as a champion of women, and he was particularly supportive of Black women. So this music that was uh, degrading and negative and disrespectful to Black women, Prince protested it, not only in denying requests to sample his music, but he also used his own music to counter and challenge these negative depictions, as he does in the song, The Days of Wild where he really calls on his contemporaries to not normalize or perpetuate the degradation of women. Another aspect of him using his art to confront his contemporaries is uh, when he talks about the gun violence, the black on black senseless death. He says, I got a tech nine too, and it's called my brain, shoot another brother, not today. So here, in addition to a lyrical protest, he created a microphone that was looked like a gun. It replicated the gun to subvert the increasingly ubiquitous imagery of Black men with guns and challenge people to use a different weapon. Seeking into the gun, Mike represented his use of words, his voice, his brain, as he alluded to, and his music as his weapon. And in keeping with his ethos, that music was intended to enlighten, uplift, and inspire. Here, I just listed a lot of Prince's music that, as Mary Ellison says, this coupling of Black music with protests is a natural alliance. Prince, in his illustrious catalog, has a canon of music that really depicts a broad spectrum of the Black experience, and these are just some of the songs uh, that do that. So another aspect of Prince using art uh, as part of his protests uh, is when he wrote Slave on his face. So Prince's Black consciousness was not limited to his lyrics. Writer and image activist Michaela Angel Angela Davis argues style is a language and reflects history just like any sort of visual medium. 
Prince's style is as inextricably linked to his image as his music, just as he used his body as a site of protest to resist prescriptive notions of the aesthetics of Black masculinity when he adorned himself in clothing traditionally associated with the performance of femininity. He again rendered his body a site of protest when he wrote the word slave on his face in the 1990s during his historic battle with Warner Brothers Records to emancipate himself from his contract and gain ownership of his art. Writing on his body as a form of protest art was an example of Prince at his most transgressive. With this act, he drew a profound connection between modern day labor inequities and the past enslavement of black people in America. Prince even found a way to embed art in this salient fight that revolutionized the music industry. This symbolic image of slave written on his face has become synonymous with his fight for manumission. The design, font, and placement remain consistent in his public performances and appearances, and it is forever reflective of this period of disruption in his career. Today, we see artists like Taylor Swift and Kanye West and others fighting for ownership of their music, but Prince was largely ostracized and ridiculed, dismissed as greedy and an ingrate or uppity by the mainstream media at the time when he undertook this fight. However, his battle for his ownership uh, of his art was not a selfish act. As we see from his memoir, these quotes, he situated it in a wider context of building wealth and autonomy in the Black community. Time has revealed that Prince was a visionary who fought for artists' rights, paving the way for people like Chance the Rapper uh, or Beyonce today to have ownership of their art. Entertainment attorney Gary Stifelman points out Prince drew attention to the issue of artists controlling their own destiny, and he furthered the message as much or more than anyone. This truly was a cause, not just I want to make money. The next step uh, in Prince protest art is this hugely transgressive act uh, of adopting an unpronounceable symbol as his name uh, when he was again trying to free himself from his recording contract. As he said here, the first step I have taken towards the ultimate goal of emancipation from the chains that bind me to Warner Brothers was to change my name from Prince to a symbol. According to Mitch Munson, one of the designers who worked with him on the design, Prince wanted a symbol that combined the Mars and Venus male and female gender symbols. He also didn't want it to be perfect. He wanted it to be somewhat asymmetrical like the human body. Depending on your perspective, it evokes a cross, an Egyptian ankh, which is the key of life. You might see a horn in there representing music. But at the end of the day, the symbol became iconic. It's associated with Prince. It's sometimes called the Prince symbol, sometimes called the love symbol. And according to Munson, Prince had a roadmap for the symbol. There were plans set for designs, for stages and sets and cover album covers and guitars. And he actually did all of that. Uh, at the end of the day, when we see the symbol now, we know what and who it represents. And even when he regained um, ownership of his name, he continued to use uh, the symbol. So under the symbol or as the symbol, Prince again, you know, disrupted the music industry ecosystem by becoming, you know, to date the biggest independent artists in the world. Here he was with websites and using conventional and unconventional methods to release his own music. He started MPG Records and got really creative with ways that he released his art that he owned uh, to the public. And though he was ridiculed, as he said, you know, um, you have to em have empathy to understand a situation and when people made fun of my name change, it was mostly white people because Black people empathize with wanting to change the situation. Now history has revealed that as Joe Levy said, all of the stuff that happens in the 90s, you look back on it and you think this guy is a pioneer. 
Uh, one final act that I wanted to just briefly touch on is that Prince wasn't just about the art of protest. He was about the act of it as well as we have seen with his own career. But as Mark Anthony Neal said, in art, business, and philanthropy, Prince kept an investment in the aesthetics and communities that provided him with both his voice and vision in the Black uh, community. One of these examples was him being an early funder of the Black Lives Matter movement uh, when Freddie Gray was senselessly killed. He staged the Rally for Peace concert in Baltimore, and he also supported financially um, some of the loved ones of victims of the senseless violence. And he wrote the song Baltimore that also touches on this topic and honors people like Mike Brown. Uh, Mike Brown, I'm sorry, and, and Freddie Gray. So I'll close with this comment from uh, Patrick Gaspard. Imagination is the ultimate disruptor. Whether through film, music, dance, or other mediums, art provides space for collective imagination. When faced with unjust systems that seem insurmountable, imagination can encourage us not only to aspire to achieve change, but to actively pursue it. This quote to me sums up um, this presentation because there's arguably no greater imagination than the one possessed by Prince Rogers Nelson. He employed his imagination to disrupt unjust systems and challenge notions of what it was to be a Black man, a Black artist, a Black activist, and quite frankly, a Black person. The art of his disruption evolved over time. However, it was always firmly rooted in the tradition of Black people using art as protests in the ongoing struggle for our liberation. Thank you. And there are my sources. Whether it was 1926 when Gene Toomer published Kane, or 1945 when Richard Wright published Black Boy, or 1985 when Prince Michael Jackson and Lionel Richie were the biggest pop stars on the planet, or Prince's 2001 fan imploding the Rainbow Children, or 2015 when Prince imploded the internet by uttering, quote, like books and Black Lives albums still matter, end quote, African Americans have been forced to navigate two poles of being too Black, i.e. too militant, and not being Black enough, i.e. sellouts or Uncle Tom. As such, Prince spent his entire career exploring, exposing, and even exploiting those poles for his own commercial and artistic benefit and as a way to challenge both Blacks and whites to understand African Americans as a multi-dimensional people rather than the flat, one-dimensional monolith that most tend to accept them as being. In doing this, Prince was continuing a tradition of African Americans using art to keep their humanity from being limited or denied. In 1926, Langston Hughes, in his seminal essay, The, ne the Negro Artist and a Racial Mountain, addresses the pressure applied to African Americans by these two poles of blacks and whites when he writes, quote, the Negro artist works against the undertow of sharp criticism and misunderstanding from his own group and unintentional bribes from whites. Oh, be respectful. Write about nice people. Show how good we are, say the Negroes. Be stereotyped. Don't go too far. Don't shatter our illusions about you. Don't amuse us too seriously. We will pay you, say the whites. Both would have told Gene Tuma not to write Cain. The colored people did not praise it. The white people did not buy it. Most of the colored people who did read Cain hate it. They are afraid of it. Although the critics gave it good reviews, the public remained indifferent. Yet, accepting the work of the boys, Cain contains the finest work written by Negro in America. And like the singing of Robeson, it is truly racial, end quote. Hughes seems to be foreshadowing Prince's song, Don't Play Me, in which Prince sings, quote, don't play me, I'm over 30 and I don't smoke weed, I ain't the type of stereo you trying to feed, I'm not the gander you propping my way, I've been to the mountaintop and it ain't what you say, don't play me, I'm the wrong color and I play guitar, maybe how you call us niggas ain't the same, end quote. Like Hughes, Prince was aware of the stereotypes and limitations for both sides and was bold enough to defy them. Moreover, Hughes' assertion provides two critical points for my exploration of Prince's practice of disruption. One, we learned from Hughes' essay that from the moment African Americans began producing art, there was always a war between black and white consumers over the image of African Americans. On the one side, Hughes shows black folks fighting to rescue and reclaim their image and humanity from the toilet bowl of the white imagination. As comic DJ Hughley always says, quote, the most dangerous place for black people to live is in white people's imagination, end quote. On the other side, 
few shows the white consumers using black body using the black body as everything from their desire to live vicariously through their perverted perception of black sexuality to their condemnation of black intellect and morality to affirm white supremacy. For the mass of white people, the black body was their way to engage and safely enjoy the Dionysian approach to life while being able to return to their well-crafted yet hypocritical Apollonian existence. Secondly, Hughes's use of Gene Tumor and Cain is perfect for my discussion of Prince because while Cain is often seen as the beginning of the Harlem Renaissance, for those with a myopic notion of what it means to be an African person, which includes both blacks and whites, Cain is a confounding work of art. Yet Hughes essentially asserts that it is the epitome of black excellence. As such, Cain foreshadows the struggles of an artist like Prince because of its unique structure and varied reception from critics and the public. Additionally, Richard Wright's Black Boy is another work that says more than what most think or comprehend that it does, making it another blueprint of waging multiple or simultaneous battles in one work. In the tradition of Tuma and Wright, Prince spent his career simultaneously troping and subverting stereotypes, projections, and limitations as a way to agitate for change through disruption. Ultimately, Prince, like Tuma and Wright, who has been accused of being a sellout by black fans and a racist by white fans, demonstrated that he was more than what most whites could conceive a black person to be, and even more than what many African Americans can conceive of themselves. Using Prince's lyrics, his interviews, and the interviews of others, one can parallel Prince's work to Tuma's work, Prince's work to Wright's work, and finally show how Prince used what they did to fashion his own course to disrupt how popular music perpetuates the systematic flattening and marginalization of African-American humanity. In Cain, Tuma weaves and amalgamates forms and genres so seamlessly that one wonders why it hadn't been done before. The work is a composite of vignettes that alternate in structure between narrative prose, poetry, and play-like passages of dialogue. As a result, the novel has been classified as a composite novel or a short story cycle. In short, Tuma created his own form because there was no form that enabled him to express the totality of himself. But this isn't new. This is the essence of being African, especially an African smothered in whiteness. When asked if she was on a deserted island, what book she would take with her, Toni Morrison answered, quote, I'd like to write the book that I'd like to read, end quote. Similarly, Prince, working in this tradition of blending and amalgamating structures, created a fusion of rock, soul, funk, and blues into his own genre, much like Tuma and Morrison. In his article, The Musical Alchemist for Al Pais, Luis Hidalgo asserts that, quote, the difference is Prince's influences, his musical inspirations, the ease with which he assimilates them and then reinvents them with his own personal imprint. Prince has created his own unique style, an incomparable way of making music, style you can distinguish by the second verse, end quote. Ironically, Black critics praise Kane more for its structural innovation while indicating that it didn't actually capture authentic Blackness. Writing in 1924, Du Bois was both puzzled and impressed by Cain. Quote, Tuma does not impress me as one who knows his Georgia, but he does know the human being. I cannot for the life of me, however, understand why Tuma would not have made the tragedy of karma something that I could understand instead of vaguely guess at. End quote. Du Bois is simultaneously celebrating and regarding with suspicion Tuma's wonderful crafting of imagery and his impressionistic style of painting characters and circumstances with the brush of universality rather than with the verse of authenticity. Let's not forget what Hughes said about black artists trying to make themselves palatable to white audiences by highlighting their universal aspects as opposed to highlighting their African-American aspects. Quote, this is the mountain standing in the way of true Negro art in America. The urge within the race towards whiteness, the desire to pour racial individuality into the mold of American standardization and to be as little Negro and to be as much American as possible, end quote. To some, the statements of Hughes and Du Bois may seem contradictory, but that's only if one has a limited understanding of American history. While Hughes and Du Bois wanted African Americans to be seen and valued for their human worth, they understood that in America, the only way that African Americans were ever valued was not by embracing and celebrating their Africanness or their African Americanness, but by rejecting their Africanness and constantly showing white people how white they could be. 
As such, readers could conceive Hughes and Du Bois' praise for Cain while being warned by them not to allow Cain to serve as a Trojan horse that seduces black folk into perpetuating Du Bois' double consciousness by constantly viewing and evaluating themselves through the lens of whiteness. Clearly, Hughes and Du Bois are equally concerned with the attempts of both blacks and whites to limit the creative thrust of black artists. In his song, Hello, Prince echoes their concern and declares his resolve not to be seduced, bullied, or shamed into playing by the well-established and limiting rules. Prince states, quote, they called me rude when I called their hand. They judged me and told me that we were through. Why can't you be like the others? Why can't you learn to play by the rules? Maybe at last that's the end because I'm not like the others. I'm unique in the respect that I'm not you, end quote. Another black scholar, J. Sanders Redding, writing in 1939, provides a third perspective, praising Kane as an experimental success because of the influence it had on the course of Negro fiction, end quote. Then there are the white critics providing another perspective. John Armstrong praised Kane for providing a different type of African-American image rather than the usual lazy chicken-stealing nigga of musical comedies and burlesque. A second white critic, provides an unfavorable view of Cain. Robert Lithgow wrote in his 1920 review that, quote, Cain does not remotely resemble any of the familiar superficial views of the South on which we have been brought up. On the contrary, Mr. Toomer's view is unfamiliar and bafflingly subterranean, end quote. The problem with Cain, which continues to impact how Prince and his work are received, is that most folk, black and white, do not have the ability to understand that all of these things are philosophically true and empirically factual. Rather than assuming that only one of these five assertions could be correct because art created by a black person couldn't possibly be that complex, it would have been more fruitful for readers to understand that Cain is aesthetically and structurally something that had never been created before. This would have not only served for a better reception to Kane, it would have affirmed a tradition that would have prepared more critics and listeners for other multi-textual and multi-genre artists such as Prince. While Prince is regarded as a legend, only three of his albums, Purple Rain, Batman, and Diamonds and Pearls, were the largest selling albums of their year of release. The vast majority of Prince's work received high to lukewarm critical praise and good to lukewarm sales in the same fashion as Kane. At the core of this good to lukewarm perception is that Prince's work, like Kane, was often deemed too eclectic for its own good, disparaged for being too ambitious, too challenging, and too self-indulgent, as if Black artists should not strive to study and express the totality of their humanity. Of controversy, one critic wrote, quote, it is, not, it is also more ambitious than its predecessors, attempting to tackle social protests along with sex songs, and it tries hard to bring funk to a rock audience and vice versa. Even with all the Prince's ambitions, the music on controversy doesn't represent a significant breakthrough, and it is considerably less catchy and memorable, end quote. This type of critique merely highlights the inability of most critics to view Black creators as holistic beings. It's acceptable for Prince to be a sexual icon, but based on that critique, he should not try to be a social political activist because black people don't have the brain power or the ethos to be complex and nuanced in their engagement of life. Similarly, in 1944, Harper and Brothers accepted Richard Wright's autobiography, American Hunger, for publication that fall. However, the Book of the Month Club, which was the most influential entity for American book sales, requested that Wright remove the second half of the book because they did not paint a favorable portrait of Northern whites. While East Coast white liberal elites could support Wright's negative portrayal of Southern whites, they were not about to allow Wright to critique their feelings. At the core of this double critique is Wright's determination and courage to critique both white supremacy in the North and the South and to critique Black ineptitude and Black self-limitation. On the one hand, Wright critiques conservative Southern whites for their overt racism and liberal rights for their covert and patronizing racism. Wright critiques the Southern conservative for employing a Black who affirmed their negative notions of Blackness rather than employing an educated Black person who refuted their notions of Blackness. He critiques a Northern liberal white for being amazed that a Black person could read and he critiques the extreme Northern liberal communists for not seeing him in his individuality. Wright's use of the word individuality 
cuts to the heart of a society of white people, Northern and Southern, conservative and liberal, and all that struggle to overcome their racism to see him and other African Americans as individuals, which means to be unable to see them as humans. Prince provides this same condemnation with his song, The Sacrifice of a Victor, in which he states, quote, in 1967 in a bus mark public schools, wrote me and a group of unsuspected political tools. Our parents wanted what it was like to have another color near, so they put their babies together to eliminate the fear, fighting one another all because of color. The angel of hate, if she called me anything but Victor, you know she called me something like nigger, end quote. Like right. Chris is asserting that the driving aspect of racism is that far too many whites are unable to see African Americans as nothing more than objects, as evidenced by the term nigger, which serves as a blanket term under which to house all African Americans, regardless of their differences or aspirations. Furthermore, Wright and Prince address the internalization of self-hatred that causes African Americans to belittle and assault each other. Rice focuses on his grandmother and Aunt Addie, who beat him mercilessly, mercilessly under the guise of religion. Rice states, quote, I had often been painfully beaten, but almost always I had felt that the beatings were somehow right and sensible, and I was in the wrong. Now, for the first time, I felt an equal of an adult. I knew that I had been beaten for a reason that was not right. I sensed some emotional problem in Aunt Addie other than her concern for my eating in school. Did my presence make her feel so insecure that she felt she had to punish me in the front of the pupils to impress them? End quote. What most myopic scholars do when addressing White's portrayal of his grandfather, his grandmother, and Aunt Addie is that they conveniently omit that Wright makes it clear that their physical abuse of him was due to them being children of slaves who suffered the same abuse from their parents and the slave masters, as well as the other indignities of being a black person of their time. Prince also addresses black on black belittling and assault in the song Billy Jack Bitch, which is directed towards Cheryl Johnson, AKA CJ, an African-American gossip columnist who was based in Minneapolis and not only wrote several negative reviews about Prince's work, but also engaged in personal attack, causing him names such as Cymbalina. Rather than returning, rather than returning negative with negative, Prince involves himself in a civil discourse, attempting to show a question how anyone expects to get positive from someone if they treat them in a negative manner. Prince sings, quote, what if I called you silly names, just like the ones that you called me? What if I filled your eyes with tears, so many you could not see? What if I told you that you were only half of what you feel? Would you come forth and tell no lies? Would you come forth and talk to me? Whether it was lyrically, musically, or through fashion, Prince, like Wright and Tuma, was not willing to allow another black person to limit him because that black person had chosen to limit oneself. Therefore, in this tradition of Wright and Tuma, Prince was willing to fight both white supremacy and black lim limitations to make sure that all African Americans with him and after him were able to be the holistic human beings they were designed to be. And I thank you for listening to me. Hello. Good to see you all. Uh, thanks for your wonderful presentations. Uh, I have to look down here. That's what I'm doing. All right. Let's get into some back and forth. Uh, so many resonances, so many places to begin. But one thing that I'm curious about, one thing that really stood out, and this was in Camila's presentation, was him writing slave on his face. This is a big, 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 you know, this is, this is a monolith in the history of Prince. And it's interesting to me that at the time he was pretty roundly ridiculed for it in the media. And we look back on it now and it's a whole other matter. We see it, we see it from a completely different side, I think, just societally. But maybe I'm kidding myself that, you know, it was not always seen that way by Black folks. Right. Who wants to start? 
Um, I'll go ahead and take it, uh, it, just get it started. But I think that's why it was important for me to include that quote um, where he himself uh, stated that the people who were ridiculing him were white people during that time, because as he said, black people empathize with wanting to change a situation, which is also why I paired it with the quote from Dear Mr. Man, uh, might not be in the back of the bus, but it still feels just the same, because by you know, invoking slavery and writing a slave on his face, the kind of idea of the million dollar slave, if you will, is that as he would say at that time, if I don't can't control my work, if I can't control my output, if I'm not free to do what I want to do, it doesn't matter how much money or fame I have, what am I? And so I think, you know, Black people, you know, really understood that though we were no longer in bondage, you know, slavery had not ended. And so even here we are in 2021, you know, still trying to find a way to dismantle, you know, the structures of racism and the mechanisms that keep it in place. And I think, uh, yeah, I think that was part of the disconnect that we started to see increase with Prince's fan base and the way that the public received him is that black people, you know, kind of understood what was happening, whereas the white people didn't. And I think C. Lee's presentation really kind of spoke to the, where the break in that understanding happened. Mm -hmm. C. Lee? Uh, and and um, that's, she, she summed it up perfectly. I will only add that what, what we see is that much like Harry Tubman, and I don't want to say this lightly, but sometimes those who want to be free have to drag those who are afraid to be free kicking and screaming from the plantation. And yeah. I remember specifically, and I love to make it kind of a class thing, uh, as Prof. Cummins said, and, and, and as Prof. Duff has also said, uh, you know, the working class Black people, they were probably a little bit more aligned with Prince, but there were a lot of, you know, I, I remember, I can't, and I don't want to misquote him, but I think it may have been either Nelly or someone who, was like, yeah, well, you know, when Prince was getting paid, he had no problems. And so now that he ain't getting paid, he got problems. And so, but just a few years later, Nelly and many people who denounced Prince were all singing a different tune. So I think that, that speaks to Prince's innovation that, you know, as, as, as we all know, the first person who wants to get free from, from, the, from the insanity that we think is normal, that person is crazy. But it isn't until that person really frees oneself that the rest of us realize that no, 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 Prince is right. This insanity is not normal. Sorry, I had myself muted just so I wouldn't be uh, jumping in. But let's talk a little bit more broadly about, you know, this stuff was, when, when he was writing Slave on His Face, this was the pre-digital era. This is before the internet really comes in and starts to move things around. And Prince is not only early to the internet, but he's early, he's black and early to the internet. So I wonder if you guys could maybe talk about that a little bit, talk about, you know, what it meant for him to be an online pioneer as a black man. Well, actually, um, black people are often some of the first people to adopt technology. It's just that sometimes there's a digital divide with a have and have nots, and that has to do no more with economics and not with race. So uh, for instance, um, um, I was one of the first black designers when it came to the internet and designing websites for people like David Bowie and uh, Britney Spears and, and so on and so forth. And so there were a lot of, um, you know, internet groups, you know, like we had, um, you know, like there was alt.prints. I can't remember the exact, you know, but like we were all, we were we were there we're always there it's just that this is um perception in the press um there's this mythology that continues to be um sort of um double down on that you know that black people are slow to ad adopt technology when in fact um you know we're we're leading clubhouse i mean the reason why clubhouse is so popular is because of black folks i mean so I mean, obviously it started out with some of the elite in terms of the celebrity culture, but like when it shifted um, and the popularity, I think has to do with a lot of the black um, house rooms on that particular platform. So Prince um, has always been an innovator. Um, heck, my own grandfather was an innovator and he didn't graduate from high school. Um, you know, he had his, he had a gourmet, um, um, 
food truck before that was, you know, a thing, you know, back down in the South, you know, going from, you know, all the revivals and whatnot. So um, Black people, because of where we're positioned in society, we always have to figure out ways to be inventive and entrepreneurial. And Prince is basically just a child um, of that whole that whole thread of you know making something out of nothing so prince you know he came from that so he's just a representation of a lot of black people and what they had to do to you know to succeed camila oh, you said, oh, please go ahead no, very good prof comments go ahead oh no you're going to ask a question um Mike? oh i was simply to it, it Seely should just go, and then I'll come I in. Think so too. <laughs> I, the, the, the only thing I was going to add is I would say to to kind of index Prof Duffy's statement is that you should everyone should read an article titled "The Neo Grio" by Columbia Asalam. And what Columbia Asalam does in that essay, "The Neo Grio," is he specifically plots the advancement of, of audio technology to black music, and he's essentially saying that every time there's new audio technology record player, CD, it's all an attempt of Western society to capture black music. And so in a sense, Prince being one of the first major people to internet and Prince using phones, he was really continuing the tradition of what it meant to be a black person to innovate the world through art. Um, Camila said something in the chat that I wondered if you might want to talk about here, expound upon. It was a few minutes ago, though, so we may have flown that, uh, flown past that by now. Oh, I don't know. I was busy in the chat, but what I, I'll just say to kind of come into what see, Lee was saying, I think this is why it's so important to do work that centers Blackness um, in Prince's narrative, because what we we have started to see, uh, particularly since 2016, is an erasing of Blackness from Prince's narrative. And if you begin to situate him within the context of who he is, you have a better understanding and expanded awareness, a deeper understanding of what he was doing. You know, if you don't have that if you separate or extricate him uh, from who he is culturally, the culture that you know, fed him, fortified him, uh, influenced him, as Mark Anthony Mills said, that he drew from and invested in, then you lose a lot of this. So I think that's one of the things that's so important because when we contextualize Prince um, as something other than Black, we lose a lot. Or as uh, C. Lee pointed out in his presentation, if we only focus on three albums that did well you know, in the crossover white market, we miss a lot. Something that Adam Sexton, hey Adam, thanks for joining us, uh, asked in the chat that I would like to come to with D'Angela's amazing presentation was uh, her opinion of um, why, what she thought about controversy, for example, as she said, it's a blueprint. If we look at that album, we really see the rest of Prince's career, the, the uh, blueprint for it, but that's an album that's not talked about as much and um, it would be great D'Angelo to hear you maybe explain what your thoughts are about that and thanks for the question Adam. You're muted. D'Angelo you're muted. Thank you so much for letting me know that I was muted but thank you so much Adam for the question. Um, I wish that I had saved um, this tweet from Questlove where he totally dismissed controversy and that was the beginning of my anger about why people are dissing and dismissing controversy. It was years ago, it's maybe two or three years ago, but I realized that I can't be mad at quite love because a lot of people feel this way. One, Dirty Mind was a really pivotal record for Prince. I do not, you know, dismiss that. Obviously it was super, super important for Prince. You wouldn't get controversy without Dirty Mind, but as I said in the presentation, it's just a stepping stone. Um, and 1999, just um, because of the commercial success, and obviously this is when Prince got on MTV, that's when only Prince and Michael Jackson were being played on MTV, and Prince got on MTV because of Little Red Corvette, and because Little, Little Red Corvette was more pop. Um, but if you actually go back and look at record sales, um, Dirty and Mine actually didn't go gold until after Purple Rain in 1985, and it's still not platinum. 
Blow Your Mind is still not platinum versus um, Controversy actually went gold in less than three months. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it also became platinum in 1985. So 1999, because one, you know, again, because of MTV, also it was, you know, the double album. Um, it was sort of the beginning of the revolution, you know, because you do have the revolution on the cover of 1999. It's just backwards. Um, I didn't see that at the time. Um, so it gets a lot of um, press, you know, from the critics because of its importance in terms of breaking that that white threshold on MTV. And then, you know, with Dirty Mind, because, you know, just Prince really, you know, changed. He, 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 he really, you know, um, presented himself in a, in a different way than even say the second album, which is Prince. Um, even though, again, you can see threads, you know, particularly the sex, I call it the sex thread, you know, all the way through from the beginning, even on 1978. And, you know, don't forget, you know, Prince, you know, riding bareback on the peg the white pegasus you know on the the back cover of prince you know the second album who could forget so, that yeah who can forget that yeah but it was like a, a soft you know i was like soft porn you know versus <laughs> you know, like dirty mind being like hardcore um but controversy i think it's because you know people just talk so much about Dirty Mind in 1999 that they totally forget that controversy was there. And if you remember that quote from Matt Thorne, a lot of people think that it's a little redundant, like meaning like the sound is kind of similar, you know, either to, you know, parts of Dirty Mind or some of 1999. Um, but I think it's the opposite. I, I really do think that um, one thing really awesome about controversy, and I'll shut up because I could talk all day about controversy, is that I think it's one of the best mixed Prince records. And a okay player just released an article um, this week where they interviewed um, one of the engineers on that record. And it turned out that Prince actually mixed that record. He, you know, oh. which even lets me know that it's, it's, it's like the cleanest sounding Prince record in my opinion that he ever recorded. So the sound is like super, super clean. Um, and he actually recorded that at Hollywood Sound as opposed to Sunset. Um, how it um, versus sunset um, sound. So it's it's a really interesting record, and I'll sh shut up. I can, I can I too I understand completely because I can talk about controversy all day too. And <laughs> controversy, I should I should point out, at least for me and for a lot of people I know of my generation. I'm 46, so so I was like six years old when it came out. And controversy is the most intensely Minneapolis of the Prince albums to me, and to a mm -hmm. lot of my friends. It's the one where the city felt like it got on board with him, all of it, you know? It's where he sort of, the, the legwork he had done cohered there with that album for a lot of people in the Twin Cities, I think. Well, um, what I think was about controversy specifically where Minneapolis came on board? I think it's, well, we were talking about this before and I wanted to bring this up because one of the things that I was thinking about while, during your presentation was with Dirty Mind was basically him winning the election. So controversy was more like the policy plan. Like, you know, it is the blueprint for what comes later because he draws it out for the first time. He actually states what he's about for the first time in so many words, in all these different modes, in all these different ways. So controversy really feels like the first fully coherent all world prince vehicle, if that makes sense. Oh, that's, that's Perfect sense. I mean, I, I, that's that's my agreement about it. it. What makes controversy different than than dirty mind? And I think that's a perfect analogy about getting elected and then what's your actual specific plan. And as you know, Prop Duff has said about the the four headlines, right? You knew specifically what was Prince's social political interest, right? There was no question. And 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 and, and I and I like that because and I said about it is. For me, it's it's a great album because when people say, "Well, Prince became Judgy Prince after he became a Judge," nope, 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 nope. Prince was Judgy from day one. I'm gonna keep saying it. I'm gonna keep riding that horse. If you're listening to Controversy, that's a Judgy dude. And the only difference is with Controversy, he like that he's judging other people. That's the only difference, right? Right. And then we get to we get to 1989. Still judging other people. The only problem we have with the Rainbow Children is now he's judging all us freaking people. And that's 
But so, but but in controversy, <laughs> specifically who he was, and, and as, as as all of you said, that was his specific political agenda. Number one, A plus for judging Prince. <laughs> I mean, you, you that it might be his most many. You just opened up an avenue for me here. That's his most Minneapolis album also because it's his judgiest. Yep. We're judgy here. <laughs> We're very judgy. Have any of you read the Neil Carlin book yet? I started it, but I could not bring myself to finish it. Sure. Yeah. There's, it has its longures for sure, but he talks about how Minneapolis is temperamentally in ways that I've never seen very many people attempt to do. And that deep passive aggression that is endemic here no matter what you look like is poisonous we've just seen how poisonous it can be so and we've you know hopefully expiated some of that but yeah that that really helps me to to focus on a controversy as this quintessentially twin cities thing but also because it wasn't just him he was coming out of as d'angela put it he was this was part of a, a it, there was a lot going on in the Twin Cities politically at the time. There was a lot going on through the early 80s. Um, and one song that I don't think anybody mentioned, and I apologize if, uh, because of the you know, multifarious nature of, this, of Zoom, and I'm not an educator, so I'm not used to using Zoom. Uh, I've, I've missed things here and there. But did anybody mention the song, We March? No, but it's no. it's it is a seminal. It, it, you're right to bring it up in in the, in the context because not only it's it's what I like about it relating it to to Prop Duff and Prop Commons is that We Duff is another fine tuning, right? So what I like about We March is that what you get from that is so before you had Utopia Prince, right? With race, so you think about a song like Race, so that's Utopia Prince. What Prince is doing with We March and then later with Dear Mr. Man, what Prince is saying is like, look, folks, in order to have this metaphysical utopia, we need to deal with some specific injustices of Black people. And, mm -hmm. and so Prince was specifically making another pivot, narrowing his focus on, I know all you guys love me for being this kind of erotic, uh, what you think as a mulatto, mulatto exotic being, but I'm a Black man, and if you really want to have this kumbaya moment, we have to deal with the specific injustices and travesties. And so we, we March is the perfect example of Prince planting another flag saying, here are the specific issues of race injustice that we must address. Yes, and it's a directive. We March is a directive. It's not, it's not we marched. It's not past tense at all. And, and, and just, I'm sorry, just because I don't want to forget this. We remember that, you know, again, this is controversial to some people. He specifically gave that song to Louis Farrakhan for the Million Man Mark. Exactly. So, and so again, so that comes to, to Prof Cummins' uh, uh, presentation that Prince was not only active in his art, he was active in his actions because he understood something like the Million Man March could change policy. And We March is a song about changing policy. And I wanted to thank you for that, uh, C. Lee. Um, I'm just going to take the mic uh, from you on that one, because I think that is one of the things that I was trying to uh, really argue in my presentation. I, a lot of times, and I love what you said about the reluctance of maybe the white critical establishment to see Black artists, you know, with dimension and nuance and complexity. It's often the idea that Black music is just there to make us dance or make love, but not to think and not to affect change. And I did list We March on my list of kind of the canon of Prince protest music, but it's so important for me that Prince is understood within the context of being a protest artist. Like so many Black artists, as you said in the quote that I use, it's part about reclaiming our humanity. You know, other people had to justify their barbarity by reducing us to subhuman. So remove our, you know, humanity to justify uh, the inhumane treatment of us. So as we're creating this art, it's not just for the bedroom. It's not just for the dance floor. Although Prince had us covered in both fronts, he also <laughs> was feeding our minds. And in that quote I used, it's something that he 
conveyed as far back as 1982. So then when we look at controversy, as D'Angelo pointed out in her presentation, this is all part of, I'm going to use blueprint again, his blueprint, but some people weren't ready for it. You know, in a previous talk, I mentioned how it's Prince moving from maybe the colorblind theory of the early civil rights era to more critical race theory, as you said, and saying, hey, you know, before we can get to where we all are one, we have have to be equal, you know, we have to be treated equal, we have to have equal access. And as he became more overt and direct about that, it was difficult for people so to come back full circle to him writing slave on his face, if there was ever any doubt, you know, of Prince's blackness, there it was declared when he wrote slave, you know, on on his face. And in that letter that he posted on the dawn.com saying, I feel like, you know, African Americans have been treated for the last couple hundred years. And so he's situating himself in the space of blackness and then moving forward to do that work to bring about the change that he wanted to see, not just for himself, but for others. And I think that's important too, that it wasn't an individualistic effort for Prince it was very much about the upliftment of his community. He is a fascinating person in terms of where he went, where he was coming from. You can find all sorts of tributaries in all sorts of directions with him. Yes. Uh, you, can, you can learn of the histories of many things through him. And one, but one thing that I have not seen discussed all that often and that Seeley certainly brought to mind is his taste in literature. Was he himself, was Prince himself a fan of the novel Black Boy? We, we ne I'll say this, we never, in the 18 months that I worked off and on with him, we never discussed Black Boy. But what I came to realize is that he was very well read because he was always different types of works. And I'll just, a smaller tidbit, I had to talk him off of that ledge of Atlas Rug. Because when I got there, he thought Atlas Shrugged was the greatest piece of literature he had ever read. And I was like, hey, hey, player, come on, come on back off that ledge, player, come on. But, but, but let, me, let me explain to you why. Thank Prince you for had, doing that. Prince, Prince had a time of, he would take things in a vacuum. So you have to understand where Prince was. Prince was fighting against what he saw was the exploitation of his individual genius. So what is Atlas Shrugged? Atlas Shrugged Atlas Shrug is essentially making an argument that the government is oppressing individual genes. Prince is not aware of the author's racial bias. Prince is not aware of that Atlas Shrugged is, has been, had been used to, to say Black people are the problem for that. So all Prince is seeing is that thread of, hey, just like the government is oppressing these individual genes, Warner Brothers and others doing that, like, yeah, yeah, player, yeah, yeah, but it's something, it's this month, I'm off that ledge. And so it was a talking, but to answer your question, even in that moment, he was still very literate and very well read. So I stopped there because I know we oh, you can, you, you, But you don't have to stop there. You can keep going if you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> now I'll let uh, Prof Duff and Prof Connor jump in. I want to see if they were, but, uh, but, I, I, and I was but, trying to think of the other, the other books uh, that, that he was, but he was, uh, but he was, you know, at that time he was reading a lot of Cornell West. Uh, he was also reading, uh, what, what was the other? Oh, he, 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 he was reading some Toni Morrison. So, it was, you know, he was, he was, he was meeting Prince and having a conversation with him. I understood, oh, this is why you're a great lyricist. You're very well written. And that's why you handle metaphors and tropes and symbolism so well, because you're pulling that into your body. So, yeah. Yeah, that's a, that, that's a great, uh, great observation about his lyrics. Uh, and, and I think you pointed to something that sometimes gets transmuted in the in the writing as you know as a journalist i'm guilty of it sometimes is you're taking his rock star isolation which you were just describing so vividly as being disconnected with reality entirely and it's not being disconnected it's maybe being disconnected in a day-to-day -day sense but not with the larger scope of things right right and, and I think that that's what he was trying to do by developing friendships with Cornel West and, and Tavis Smiley and other people. I always tell people, let's, let's remember, James Brown didn't write uh, Say It Loud, I'm Black and I'm Proud because he just wanted to. That was through a series of discussions from Black people who were talking to James Brown behind the scenes. And, and I think that's important because as both Prof, Prof Duff and Prof Cummings can, can elaborate too, 
That's what black community is important. So Prince understood, right? And he had this kind of, you know, push me, pull me relationship. He was always, if you look at his, his tra 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 trajectory, he was always surrounding himself with folk who could impress upon him certain social political roles that he needed to take, right? Dick Gregory again, right? So these were all people in which he was aligning himself and letting them feel him so that he could then manifest that through his art. I do want to add one thing. Um, so I'm an educator and I teach at the intersection of design, art and technology. So I create, I teach creators. And one thing that I always stress to them that in order to be a great artist, in order to have great output, you have to have phenomenal input. Like you cannot create in a vacuum. So obviously Prince had incredible inputs and he was getting it whether, whether he was having conversations with people like Cornell or Tavis or from reading literature or listening to other music. Um, like you cannot be an artist as great as Prince without having some inputs. You can't create in a, in a vacuum. Right, right. Um, I wanna take a question that was put up a little bit ago. Uh, it's from Paul W. Short. Uh, what are the benefits in viewing Prince through the lens of Afrofuturism? Well, I, I would I, I would just say the, the the benefit is that it gives you a more holistic understanding of who he was as a man and who he was as an artist. I, I think that particularly if you look at so many Afro future future futurist artists who are influenced by him, right, and you can see the his his, his rivers in them. I think that it then it it, it gives you a more well rounded appreciation of him, but it also gives you a well rounded appreciation of African American art and of our humanity. I think one of the things that I think all three of us are trying to stress is when you try to whittle Prince down to one slice of his pie chart, you're not just reducing him as a man, you're reducing all of what it means to be an African being. And so Prince as an ingenious visionary, and then, and then uh, uh, you know, this because Prof. Duffin was speaking to this, him being a, a root for Afrofuturism, again, affirms what Prof. Duff was saying is that Black people, it's not that we haven't been involved in technological advancement, it's that it hasn't been documented that we have been. And this is what that kind of research in the Prince is doing and with the question that was asked, by documenting that Prince is influencing Afrofuturism, documents that we were there at the beginning. That is fantastic. And we're going to wrap it up. They have given me the signal. So thank you all for a really fun, productive, fascinating uh, uh, round delay. Really appreciate it.